Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. This is our monthly program uh, sponsored by Sheboygan County, and we try to bring you the issues and the people that are controlling the activities of Sheboygan County Government. I'm Dan Lamihu, County Board Chairman, co-hosting the program with Adam Payne, our Administrative Coordinator. Uh, this month, we have with us our Sheboygan County Community Resource Development Agent. It's a long title, but it's a short name, Dave Such. Good to have you with us today, Dave. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm looking forward to this program today because this is a department that I know very little about. And, and I, uh, usually politicians don't like to admit that, <laughs> that, that they don't know something about, about an issue. But um, since I've been on county board, I, I've gotten to know you, Dave, a little bit uh, with the program you did for the village of Oostburg. Uh, a few years ago, but I really am not real familiar with your department, and, and so this is going to be a learning experience for me today, just like our viewers. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself first and the position that you have in the UW Extension. Sure. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, grew up about 40 miles south here in Germantown, and I think uh, back in the 1950s, and um, um, we had a uh, family farm, my uncle had a farm, we lived adjacent to it, and we were sitting up on this end moraine, and we could see we were about 25 miles away from Milwaukee, and over the years saw Milwaukee encroaching, and probably that's why um, that experience uh, prov provided me with some uh, impetus to go into planning and work on long-range planning programs we'll talk a little bit later, seeing the sprawl encroaching from the south, and now we're seeing it encroaching in Sheboygan County. So uh, just growing up um, 40 miles south here gave me those kinds of experiences. I uh, went to school at Carroll College and UW-Green Bay, got bachelor's and master's degrees in planning. Um, I did some time at uh, uh, Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission and Bay Lake Regional Planning Commission, which Sheboygan County is in that region. Um, and then about, oh, back in the 1980, um, joined Extension as a similar position, community resource development agent, that's quite a mouthful, and also the department head, and I was there for a dozen years before coming to Sheboygan County in 1993. And uh, uh, my wife, who, uh, that was the whole reason for coming here, really, <laughs> is the uh, person I was going with was from Adele originally, a good Hollander, um, Pat Dulmes, and we got married, and we have a, a three and a half year old, and uh, she knew Sheboygan County was the best place to live, and I would tend to agree. I've been here now eight years in the county and uh, working with the local officials, which is part of my, uh, one of my responsibilities, um, and I find that to be true. Just some great people here, and uh, the quality of life in Sheboygan County is fantastic. And as an extension agent, um, I have an opportunity to, to work with communities for maintaining and enhancing quality of life. So, You mentioned the UW Extension. And, and, and we're going to say that right. throughout the, the course of this, this half-hour program. Um, I think there's probably a lot of confusion out in the community. I know I was confused for many years. What is the UW Extension? What is the UW Sheboygan Center? Yeah. Um, could you maybe just explain the, the functions of the office a little bit? Sure. We, we get those kinds of calls all the time um, asking about a certain course, and they say, we have to respond, well, that's... That's kind of our cousin, the, uh, the two-year campus. Back in the 60s, um, the, the two-year campuses in the University of Wisconsin system were called extension. But the county extension offices had been around for quite a while since, uh, well, about 86 years now, back to 1914. So um, we truly are the extension of the university. And you might have heard of something called the Wisconsin idea that was coined back around the turn of the century. The boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. And we're, as extension agents, to take the knowledge and information of the university and apply it to people's real world needs. Actually, extension got its um, start back in the days of Abraham Lincoln in the 1860s when um, Abraham Lincoln uh, recognized that uh, for this nation to be a great one, they needed to link uh, or transfer information on the part of the universities to what was then subsistence agriculture. People were just growing enough food for themselves. And you know, Abraham Lincoln said, for, uh, f to make this a great nation, we have to be providing food for the railroad engineer, for the factory worker, and things like that. And that required transfer of information from the university setting to, uh, 
to the people out in the then the rural areas. And that's really how Extension got its start. Um, the Morrell Land Grant College Act, which was uh, passed in 1862, transferred federal dollars to states to start building a research base to apply it to um, increasing food for, for one example and then developing this network. It was then in 1914 when Woodrow Wilson, president, um, signed the Smith-Lever Act, which basically provided money to transfer that information and create uh, extension offices like ours. Um, so we've got a, a long tradition, primarily started in agriculture. Um, it's since evolved uh, in, in Wisconsin. The University of Wisconsin system is the land-grant college, and um, we, um, we are a part of this huge University of Wisconsin system. We're a little unique because we have a relationship with the county. Uh, I think from the historical past, you can see there is a linkage between government and education. And some people say, well, why is the like, county government in the education business? But there is this long-standing tradition and uh, reason behind why government and education um, partnered. And that tradition continues on. It's not just agriculture. Now, um, fast-forwarding to the year 2000, in the University of Wisconsin system, we have the 14 uh, our 13 four-year campuses like UW-Madison, UW-Milwaukee, et cetera. We have 13 two-year campuses like UW-Sheboygan, UW-Manitowoc. And then there's this thing called Extension, which is comprised of four divisions, one of which is uh, public broadcasting. Uh, public television and radio is part of that division. We have one continuing extension education, which provides training for people, professionals like in real estate, to keep them current in upgrading their skills. Um, there's another one called um, Manufacturing Extension, which has our small business development centers, which provides counseling for um, people looking to start a business or existing businesses that need assistance on um, perhaps marketing or management, things like that. And then we have this thing called co-op extension, which I'm a part of. In Wisconsin, we have 72 um, county cooperative extension uh, offices, and each one is a little bit different in terms of the issues we address. We, um, we are a partnership between the county, state, and federal government. Our salaries are funded 40% by the county in which we work, and, uh, sixty percent by the state and federal governments but we work one hundred percent in the county we're assigned to so i look at it from an economic development standpoint as a we always talk about economic development theory plugging the leaky bucket our tax dollars are taxed away to higher levels of government this is one way state and federal dollars are coming back into these positions the county gets for forty percent you're getting a hundred usually hundred and fifty percent because we have a lot of night meetings we spend a lot of time working with the um, the citizens of the county out there so it's really a good economic development strategy you're getting state and federal dollars back into the county so um, we'll pay for the first forty percent and let this let the state and universities sure. <laughs> pay for the overtime yeah. how many employees do you have in, in the extension office in Sheboygan County we have a total of twelve and that's about um, in terms of other state offices, that's about um, middle of the range. Some extension offices, especially in northern Wisconsin, have fewer. Those agents might focus more on tourism issues or forestry. Um, some of the larger offices have, in some cases, 60 um, employees. So we're, we're not small, we're not large, we're somewhere in between. Um, we're an urbanizing county, uh, Sheboygan, with uh, about 112,000 people, so um, we're the way we're organized, um, we have four major program areas, uh, one of which is 4-H youth development. And some people throughout the county have heard of one of these. They may not um, associate all the other things falling under this extension banner, but we have the 4-H program. A lot of people went through the 4-H program as youth. Um, we also have a family living program. We have an ag and ag business and natural resources program, and then mine is community natural resource and economic development. So we've, we started out primarily focusing on food production, and we still do some of that, but we've evolved into much more, taking that and looking at the um, real world needs of people and trying to bring university knowledge to bear upon those issues and problems. Okay, so you have these four basic groups or, or divisions in your office. What type of services do these four different groups offer to the community? 
A, a very broad spectrum. Um, probably people that know anything about the Extension Office know us for our bulletins, and we have bulletins just about on everything from uh, that covers the waterfront, the full spectrum. So, especially in the uh, um, gardening and uh, um, Oh, like lawn care and things like that. We're we're known for those, but we have. So, so if I you're the off you're the guy I call when I have brown spots on my lawn in yep, three months yep, from now. Right. Okay. Yep. And typically we get calls for people that don't know where else to go. The extension office is typically uh, the place where we get those kinds of calls, and uh, we usually don't turn anyone away. We'll try and uh, if we don't have the answers locally, we'll try and find them. We have this huge research base. I mean, we have the whole entire University of Wisconsin system backing us. Up. And it's been said um, for each position in the county, there's about uh, at least $80,000 of specialist backup. Uh, so we don't have to be the experts in all the areas. However, we have these um, specialists in Madison and throughout the university system that we can call upon to get people the answers to their questions and their informational needs. 4-H. Uh, Pe people, you said a lot of people have gone through the 4-H program. Right. Um, Tell us a little bit about what we have in Sheboygan County. Well, we, the, the 4-H program in Sheboygan County is one of the, um, the top five in the state of Wisconsin um, in terms of enrollment. We have um, almost 1,200 uh, youth actively enrolled in 4-H, plus our two 4-H agents um, work with other youth through uh, high schools and uh, middle schools, grade schools. The 4-H program itself um, enrolls children, youth from the age of 6 to 19. And like I said, we have 1,200 youth um, actively involved. We also um, have, it's, it's a family opportunity. We have about um, 468 um, adult leaders in the 4-H program. And really 4-H is, is all about teaching life skills. And in fact, I work with a lot of local units of government. Many of those uh, local officials went through the 4-H program. So what we're trying to do is teach leadership skills and uh, job skills. There's opportunities through the, uh, the programs like, you know, typically people think of 4-H projects at county fair. Um, however, those are teaching life skills and also developing job skills on the part of these youth. So, uh, and speaking, public speaking skills, you name it. Uh, we look at it as probably a, a good investment of um, taxpayers' dollars from the standpoint. I think I, I saw some statistics that um, it, it cost about uh, over $44,000 to send one youth to the Lincoln Hills Correction Facility, and uh, we only have a fraction of that budget for a fraction of one uh, youth going to Lincoln Hills for our entire 4-H program. So we think it's money well invested, especially when you're making that kind of positive impact with 1,200 youth each year. Um, it, we feel it's, it's money well spent. With only two full-time staff people working directly for it, you have a lot of volunteers working for it. Yep. Um, I'm sure you're always looking for, for more. Uh, what, what kind of a, a commitment do they need to make to, to work with the 4-H the programs? Well, typically, I said we have about 468 adult leaders, and they're volunteering on the average about 80 um, hours per year. If we if we affix some type of monetary value on that um, volunteer time, let's, let's even say minimum wage around $5 per, per hour, uh, that translates to about uh, 32,000 hours times $5 is about 187,200. If we had to pay those a meaningful wage, say about $15 an hour, um, the volunteer time that's devoted to the 4-H program is over half million dollars, about $560,000, and that's all uh, again, volunteer gratis, and but it becomes a, a partnership again with the 4-H agents. We only have two, and we have a large program. Um, we use the multiplier effect, training these leaders and bringing their skills uh, into play, and for positive outcomes with the young people of our county. So, um, again, we're, we're a small staff in that regard, but I think by using the multiplier and just the volunteer commitment on the part of the uh, Sheboygan County citizens, we've been able to, like say, take uh, take the 4-H program and develop it into one of the top five That's in the great. state. Great. You gave a wonderful history lesson earlier on the, the roots of the extension. 
and the, uh, the focus on the agricultural sector. And I'm real proud that I have a, a grandmother who has a century farm on TT here in Sheboygan right. County. And I know that she's received services from your office in the past. Could you touch on a little bit some of the services that are provided primarily for the agricultural community as well as the value of the agricultural sector sure. for Sheboygan County? Well, just give you a little background on um, the agricultural setting in the county. Um, most people realize that the family farms are diminishing, and, and I just, in fact, uh, looked up some statistics of our county. If we go back uh, 100 years, 1900, in Sheboygan County, we had 3,572 farms covering about 307,600 acres. That's 90, that, then, 100 years ago, that was 95% of the land area of the county. Um, and the average farm size was about 86 acres. 100 years later, in the year 2000, the number of farms, I said we had 3,572 in 1900. In the year 2000, we had 1,170 farms. So yes, the farms have diminished. Uh, the number of acreage also diminished to, down to 204,000 from 307,000, which is about 63% of the land area of our county. So about a third uh, reduction in terms of land area devoted to agriculture. Um, at, but the farm size actually increased. It's now the average farm size jumped from 1900 at 86 acres per farm to 174 acres. And I think that's a trend we're going to continue to see with the large larger corporate farms that are um, popping up. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, it still is an important segment of our economy. I mean, land-wise, we're talking 60% of the land area. And also, you know, there's 1,200 farms out there yet, and uh, that's a significant part of our economy. Um, our dairy and lives, we have two ag agents. One focuses on dairy and livestock, the other on crops and soils. So they're continuously working on um, increasing knowledge on the part of our farmers to keep them current with new production trends, to keep them profitable, and that's very difficult in this day and age, but uh, that's what our mission is, to try and keep them profitable. And providing all different things, um, new and innovative things. I know our crops and soils agent um, went to a conference and he found out about 15-inch corn rows, and we started doing some pilots in, in the county on that, and, and the savings that would um, have for farmers and also the increase in profitability on, on implementing a new uh, technique like that. So that's really what we're trying to do is apply research from the university and bring it to bear upon um, our local needs here in the county. So. I'm sure a number of our viewers didn't recognize just how many farms we have in Sheboygan County and you said 1,200? Right, active farms. 1,200 active, active farms. That's correct. Could you be a little more specific on the role they have on our economy, the value that they bring? Sure, uh, and just maybe one focus, uh, the dairy industry. Of those 1,200 farms, there's about 339 dairy farms um, in our county um, with about 26,500 cows. Um, the average milk production per cow um, is about um, annual milk production is 17,500 pounds. And annually, th that means uh, the sale, milk sales in our county is about $174 million. So that's a significant part of our economy. Um, when you take a look at total farm and farm-related employment in our county, we have about 12,000 jobs. There's obviously 1,200 farms, and, and some of these farms are going, hiring additional people. Some are working even, you know, three shifts. And um, so we have about 12,000 jobs or 20% of our county's labor force is in agriculture or ag-related jobs. So that's a significant part. And again, we have two people um, on our staff that deal with that, trying to keep those, that part of our economy, economy profitable. Very so good. Very good. What are some of the other services that you provide to the agricultural community? Well, it's, it, it's not only the agricultural community, but we're seeing now, even though the number of farms has diminished, we're seeing more hobby farms, people buying, uh, moving, former urbanites moving into the rural area, um, purchasing 35, 40 acres. Um, they're not used to that amount of land, and they have this, uh, this acreage, and they want to know, well, can we do something, develop some specialty crops? Um, what about herbicides and pesticides and things like that? There's, there's becoming more of a, a need for um, the rural hobby farmer in our county uh, providing information that we kind of just took for granted for the, uh, the actual full-time farmer. Um, this information has to be transferred so that, in fact, 
urbanites that have moved out to the rural areas, it's been said, have been applying fertilizers 10 times the rates of, uh, of the farmer. And they need to know that more isn't often better, and we're seeing the impacts of that through um, increased nitrates in, in the groundwater and things like that. So we continue to have probably more of an educational role in the agricultural area than ever before with these um, smaller hobby farms popping up and people not having uh, the background. So uh, those people are also coming to our office for information about you know the brown spots on the lawn. From May until October, we have um, a training program. Our crops and soils agent has a program set up that they train master gardeners. We have uh, uh, 65 volunteer master gardeners that come into our office from May until October and handle the calls. We generally take about 700 calls uh, during that period on uh, garden, lawn, uh, tree, uh, horticulture, I guess is what you'd call it, uh, those types of questions. So again, we only have one individual. He would just be spending all the time on the phone. So we, again, use that multiplier effect and train people who, in turn, uh, for the training and expertise, they volunteer time for our office. So that works extremely well. Earlier, you mentioned the family living program. Could you talk about that a little bit more? Sure. Uh, actually, family living was one of the, the early, uh, just like the county agent or the ag agent uh, got it started a long time ago when the food was being produced, there was a real concern about food safety and, um, and how to prepare the food and things like that. So originally, um, the positions were called home demonstration agents, you know, teaching people how to safely prepare food. And that's evolved. We now, um, we had a home economist and that's the position has changed to a family living educator. And that person is taking more, in the food area, taking a look at more uh, nutritious foods when people are more concerned about diet as we're aging. Um, also, uh, financial management has become a, a, an important program of the family living uh, educator, helping people um, manage their funds better, especially when we're seeing uh, uh, elderly people, especially a, a, a widow that uh, may not have uh, had anything to do with the finances, now is put in a position where they're suddenly in control, the husband passes away, they need some help in terms of um, how they set up the checkbook and how do they do the cash flow and things like that. That's what our family living program is, is focusing on. So, you know, we've been around for 86 years. Um, we haven't stood still. We continuously try to focus on the, uh, the changing needs of our citizens in the county, and, and that's what we're all about. We keep our ears to the track and try and keep current and provide relevant information to meet their needs. One of my favorite stores is Fleet Farm, and my father-in-law always says, if you can't find it there, you don't need it. <laughs> and uh, you've talked about such a breadth of programs and, uh, and services. I'm sure our viewers have a much better appreciation for the, all the services that you provide. In your role, how do you determine what areas to focus on? Well, uh, two ways, uh, specifically, all county extension offices once every four years do a major needs assessment. Um, we involve community-wide surveys, do focus groups, face-to-face -face meetings, get input from the citizens we work with or don't work with, try and get um, input as to what the priority issues are. So once every four years we do a major uh, county-wide needs assessment. So that provides direct input to keep us on track. Um, and then each of the individual program areas also are doing needs assessments internally with our programs to make sure that we're, we're on tack. Oftentimes, um, some of these, th it, it may not be that scientific. For example, um, when I started in 1993, uh, the big cryptosporidium um, issue hit Milwaukee. And I got a call right in 1993 when I started in Sheboygan County from a rural homeowner and said, is there cryptosporidium in our water and how do we, how will we know? Uh, that got me thinking about the possibility of doing some type of uh, a groundwater education program. And I did some research. I found at the time, 10 years ago, we had 10,850 homes in Sheboygan County on private wells. That's a significant number. About, uh, about 27% at the time were getting their water from private sources. So um, we developed um, at County Fair, we provided uh, free um, water testing. We also have um, now over the years developed more in-depth programs working with our uh, 15 towns in the county to provide a whole host, 25 different tests for people to make sure that uh, they have a safe water supply. So part of it was, you know, the number of phone calls we get, things like that um, will we'll also determine our, our program directions. Outstanding. You talked a little bit earlier, Dave, about the 
<clears throat> the reduction in number of uh, farms and, and, and acreage being used for farming, uh, land use, planning, these, these things have gotten a lot of talk lately. Could you just, uh, we're, all, we're, we're running out of time real <laughs> fast here, um, but could you just talk a little bit about some of the planning activities you've done with different communities? Sure. Um, my degrees are in planning. I work for professional planning agencies. When I came to Sheboygan County, um, I had a request to help people establish a vision, help towns, villages, and cities establish a vision where they want to be in the future. <laughs> recognizing in the past plans pretty much were a top-down thing we needed to involve citizens in this planning process so we initiated a whole bunch of uh, public participation uh, techniques like community-wide surveys getting input granted this is more qualitative input but it's the foundation a lot of people start with zoning and they say that's the inf you know that is what we want to try and upgrade well, zoning is the enforcement tool to implement a plan which is based on people's values. If we don't involve citizens in determining that vision, um, that's the broad foundation which we need to, to establish first. So I've spent the last eight years working with about 20 of the 28 units of government in our county, getting citizen input into this visioning process. We've, we wanted to talk today about uh, smart growth and, and a lot of other things. We, we really don't have time to do that. Um, maybe in a month or two we could get you back. Sure. And, and we have, the county board has established an ad hoc uh, committee to deal with the stewardship issue. We uh, passed a stewardship referendum recently in Sheboygan County and we need to deal with that and, 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 and smart growth fits right in with, with some of those stewardship issues some of the zoning planning issues that, that you're involved with. I know you're going to be on that committee. Uh, I'm on that committee. Our first meeting is um, January 31st on a Wednesday evening. Um, for about six months, we're going to have, have a, a number of meetings to, to organize this. These meetings will all be open to the public. The uh, public is welcome to attend and, and give their input, and hopefully we'll have a, a public hearing on the same issues. Uh, so maybe after we get into that a little bit, we can, we can schedule another meeting, uh, another show, where we talk about some of those issues. and and see where that committee is heading and, and what's going on with that committee. Next month, uh, we just recently had a groundbreaking for our, for our addition to Rocky Knoll. Uh, the whole issue of, of downsizing our county facilities, our healthcare facilities. Um, after two uh, cancellations because of snowstorms in December, we finally had a groundbreaking. Next month, Adam, if I'm correct, we're going to have Gene Larrabee back and, and talk about that project, what's going on. And, and some of the, the issues involved with that and the downsizing and, and the, the care that we can give to the residents. Um, and a month from now, hopefully, we'll be, we'll be into that project a little bit more. And, and then we'll look forward to maybe having Dave back in, in, in a few months and talking about uh, smart growth, um, some of these plans that these communities have to develop in the next, what, 10 years? Right. They have 10 years to do that. And, and some of the issues with the uh, stewardship referendum. Um, Again, if, if, if our viewers have any comments about the show, if you have any suggestions for topics that you'd like us to discuss, any questions you'd like us to answer, you could reach either Adam or I at our office, uh, phone number 459-3103, and uh, leave your questions. We'll be happy to either get back to you or, we, or we'd be happy to answer the questions on the show and, and bring out to, to, the, to the viewers some of the, the answers. Thank you.